Hi, I'm Chris Potts. I have a couple related goals for this screencast. First and foremost, I want to introduce the notion of entailment. Entailment is one of the most important concepts in linguistic semantics and pragmatics. It's what enables us to use language to reason, to construct arguments, to generalize, and so forth. My secondary goal is to help you begin to explore your own intuitions about meaning. As you'll see, those intuitions can be remarkably subtle. And this too is part of why language is such a powerful tool for communication. To start, we need a bit of notation. This statement is read sentence s and tail sentence s prime. Later in the term, we'll give this a precise mathematical definition. For now, we'll just stick with the intuitions. We say that sentence s and tail sentence s prime, just in case all the possible ways the world could conceivably be that make s true, are also situations that make s prime true. And I really mean all situations, whether actual or hypothetical. Abstractly, imagine that this is the set of worlds where s is true. Then sentence s entails sentence s prime if we have a situation like this, where these s worlds are fully contained in the s prime worlds. At a more human level, the basic idea is that s entails s prime holds just in case committing to the truth of s just is com committing to the truth of s prime. For example, if someone commits to the claim that Sandy waltzed, then they are also committed to the claim that Sandy danced. Every world in which Sandy waltzed is one in which Sandy danced. Here's notation for the case where s doesn't entail s prime. It's the entailment arrow with a slash through it. For this to hold, we need only find one possible world where s holds, but s prime doesn't. In pictures, that would look like this, and there just needs to be at least one possible world in this space where s holds and s prime doesn't. This is a pretty weak notion. We expect most sentence pairs to be in the non-entailment relation. Here's an example, the reverse of the entailment case we looked at before. Here we have a failure of entailment because there are worlds in which Sandy danced, but the dance was a tango rather than a waltz. Just one such hypothetical situation is enough to mean that we don't have entailment. In that sense, a non-entailment is much weaker than contradiction. For contradiction, committing to S suffices for committing to not S prime. It's incoherent to commit to both S and S prime at the same time. Contradiction is a kind of non-entailment. It's the special extreme case where there are no worlds that make both S and S prime true. In this lecture, we're going to focus on entailment and non-entailment, but contradiction is good to have in mind, and it's just as important to reasoning in language. Okay, with those concepts in hand, let's start to explore our semantic intuitions. Here's the pair of examples we just looked at. Sandy waltzed entails Sandy danced, hence the upward arrow. But Sandy danced does not entail Sandy waltzed, hence the downward arrow with the slash through it. Now let's look at a more complex case. This one involves the quantificational determiner a. The top sentence is a student danced. The lower left sentence is a Swedish student danced. And the lower right sentence is a student waltzed. Starting in the lower left here, we find that we have an entailment arrow going up. After all, if a Swedish student danced, then of course a student danced. A Swedish student just is a special kind of student. We don't, of course, have an arrow going down from the top to the lower left. Maybe all the dancing students were Canadian. The pattern is similar, starting in the lower right. If a student waltzed, then of course a student danced. But the reverse, going from the top to the lower right, doesn't hold. Maybe all the students were doing the tango. In general, we would have entailment arrows going in both directions, just in case the sentences were completely synonymous. Where it's obvious that they aren't, we can simplify to having just one arrow, like this. Now, why are we asking about two sentences, whereas for Sandy danced, we asked about only one variant? To see why, we need to take a brief look at the syntactic structure of sentences with quantificational determiners like a. Here's a very simple syntactic structure for the basic case, a student danced. What this tree says is that a combines with student, to form a unit or constituent, that's the subject of the sentence, a noun phrase, or NP. The subject then combines with the verb phrase, or VP, to create a sentence. This is what the syntacticians tell us about the basic structure of the sentence. Semantically, we'll see later in the term that a has two arguments. First, it combines with student, which is its restriction. And it also combines with the verb phrase, its scope.
When we add in Swedish as an adjectival modifier of student, we're changing the restriction. Uh, this triangle here just means there's internal structure to this phrase that we're ignoring. When we change danced to waltzed, we're changing the scope. We can change both if we like. Here I've made them very complex. The whole sentence is a Swedish student who likes linguistics and is afraid of skiing danced while juggling in the quad. The restriction student is modified by the attributive adjective Swedish and the relative clause who likes linguistics and is afraid of skiing. And the scope is danced with the modifier while juggling in the quad. Quantificational determiners like a are in control of both these argument slots semantically. To see this, though, we need to look at more data. These sentences are exactly like the previous ones, except with determiner a replaced by no. The top sentence is no student danced. The lower left sentence is no Swedish student danced. And the lower right sentence is no student waltzed. Whereas before we had arrows going up, now we'll have arrows going down. First, if no student danced, then no Swedish student danced. However, the reverse doesn't hold. We can assume no Swedish student danced, but still deny that no student danced. Just think of dancing Canadian students who are consistent with the first sentence, but not the second. And the same holds for the scope. If no student danced, then no student waltzed, so the entailment goes down. But counterexamples to the upward direction are easy to imagine. Just think of students doing the tango. They don't affect the truth of no student waltzed, but they falsify no student danced. So far, the restriction and scope have patterned together. They come apart with every though. First, if we assume every student danced, then it follows that every Swedish student danced. That gives us a downward arrow to the lower left. Intuitively, we can think of shrinking the restriction while preserving truth. However, we do not get an arrow going from the top to the lower right. Every student danced doesn't ensure that every student waltzed. They might have all been exclusively tangoing. We do, though, get an arrow going upwards. If every student waltzed, then every student danced. Our first mixed pattern of arrows. Let's summarize the patterns we've seen so far. Our goal is to identify the underlying factors that produce them. With a, we had arrows going up for both arguments, the restriction and the scope. With no, we had arrows going down for both arguments. These examples suggest a hypothesis involving negation. Perhaps negation, as with the determiner no, causes arrows to go down. And the absence of negation, as with the determiner a, causes arrows to go up. There's something deeply right about this, but it doesn't explain the pattern that we saw with every. For every, the pattern is mixed, a down arrow for the restriction and an up arrow for the scope. So negation isn't the whole story. Nonetheless, there's something right about the negation idea. As we just saw, it explains this pattern. And if we return to our first example where the arrow went up and we negate it, then the arrow goes down, just as the negation idea would predict. Stepping that back then, we begin to see that negation allows us to infer from large sets down to the smaller sets they contain. For instance, here we go from dance down to waltz. Outside of negation, we go from small sets to the larger ones that contain them, here from waltz to dance. Now, that negation-based theory still leaves every unexplained. Later in the term, we'll be able to give a precise account of why every kind of looks like negation and kind of doesn't, the mixed pattern. Nonetheless, I think we can get at the intuition. The canonical picture of a true every statement is like this. When we add material to the restriction, we're going into subsets. For instance, the Swedish students, the Canadian students, and so forth. As we look inside the first argument, we obviously can't leave the original space of students. So if student was inside dance, then of course all its subsets will be. Hence the downward arrow. The same is not true of the scope argument. If we restrict the scope, then we could easily destroy the original containment relation. For instance, if we zoom in on the tangos, then they might all be here, making the two sets, student and tango, disjoint. 
not preserving the original containment relation in our premise. However, if we want to infer upwards from dance, from the scope, to larger sets like move that contain dance, then the original containment relation has to be preserved. This gives us the upward arrow for the scope argument. In the semantic theory we develop, we'll give a meaning to every that guarantees these inference patterns. That will give us a precise understanding of the very abstract meaning of every. To close, here's a concise summary of the patterns we saw. I added exactly three, uh, which we didn't look at, uh, as a kind of reminder that not all arguments allow entailment inferences. These dashes here mean that exactly three doesn't license inferences in either direction for either of its arguments. You can check this out yourself using examples like the previous ones. I've left the rest blank for you so you can explore your intuitions for them as well. Some of these are harder to get a grip on because other factors come into play. For example, few is hard because it has complex usage conditions mostly related to its competition with the determiner no. And only is very complicated because it is so sensitive to intonation, to where the emphasis falls in the sentence when it's spoken. Examples like that highlight the importance of studying semantic concepts like entailment at the same time that one considers broader issues of communication, as we will throughout the course.